I'm not even sure at the time in World War II we knew what psychological help was. So far as combat is concerned, somebody's trying to kill you, I think the stress is going to be the same in any kind of a war. World War I is called a shell shock. Then we came up to World War II and it became the psychoneuroses and then we came into Korea and it was uh, uh, battle fatigue and then we came to Vietnam and finally in Vietnam is where the PTSD really started and of course none of us know what. We didn't have any idea what that was. To date it's all too clear that TBI, post-traumatic stress and numerous other related mental ailments are widespread, entrenched and insidious. This department has, over time, realized that military medicine must have the same expertise, focus, and standards of excellence to address psychological wounds as we do for physical injuries. Things are so nice when you come back initially, then the regular life sets in. You start having trouble sleeping and thinking about your past experiences. I lost a lot of sleep, and so I started compensating for that by drinking so that I could sleep. I was distant from everybody in my family. The room could be filled with people that I loved and cared about, and I'd be over here thinking about what happened to me or to some of my fellow Marines in Iraq three months ago. I would get angry at things. I would get frustrated. I was angry at everything and everyone. My anger from work would carry over. Never physical. I just wanted them to go away because I didn't want them to be part of what was going on with me. It's awfully difficult to criticize yourself and to say, I need help. But you have to have the, 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 the strength, uh, I think, of military terms. You have to have the balls to go ahead and do it. Uh, get the help because you, you can become a, a detriment to your unit. You can become a problem. You're, you can become a problem at home. These things don't happen just on the battlefield. I'm Sergeant Josh Hopper, United States Marine Corps. I've been in for about right five and a half years. I've had one deployment to Africa and two deployments to Iraq. It was while I was in VMFA 115 as the executive officer that I knew Sergeant Hopper. He did two tours in Iraq as an infantry Marine, as a saw gunner. On his first deployment, he fired thousands and thousands of rounds from his weapon, saw lots of casualties, and experienced battle on a daily basis throughout his deployment. On his second one, he employed his weapon only one or two times, but uh, saw more and more uh, IEDs. In fact, he received a Purple Heart for injuries he sustained as a result of an IED. Uh, Sergeant Hopper, when he joined the squadron, came to me as one of my S2 uh, intel clerks. He was a lat move uh, from the infantry. Not only was he this big physical specimen of a Marine who could push around more weights than just about anybody else in the squadron, but uh, he also was, was a kind man, very professional, uh, did his job and did it well. I couldn't find enjoyment in anything. I couldn't even enjoy being around my own kids. I was distant from everybody in my family. You know, where it would be, I'd call my mom and dad, you know, two or three times a week. Well, they would call me two or three times a week because I wasn't calling them, and I'd just hit the ignore button. Pretty much all I did was just, I'd come home from work, you know, pour a drink of some sorts and just sit there until I fell asleep and wake up and go to work the next morning. And pretty much a repeat cycle. I'm Major General David Blackledge. I've been in the uh, Army for just short of 34 years. Uh, that first tour in Iraq, I uh, ended up spending 14 months initially as brigade commander and then assumed command of all the civil affairs forces in Iraq, uh, Kuwait, and Jordan. I was severely injured in an ambush right towards the end of my first tour and spent the next 11 months in uh, recovery, rehabilitation before I was returned to active duty. It was actually very helpful. Uh, once I got to Walter Reed, a senior psychiatrist met with me and explained some of the things I could expect as I recovered and the kind of post-traumatic stress kinds of things that, that may manifest themselves, and he, he would monitor those. I'd, I'd gotten the monitored help when I was in my recovery from injuries sustained in the ambush, but then I deployed again. Went through my second deployment, got wounded again during a suicide bombing, but it really was uh, uh, about a year after that that I was still experiencing 
nightmares. I was still having trouble sleeping. Um, I would still get angry, um, unnecessarily frustrated, and um, and I just started thinking, well, is this is this just the way it is going to be for the rest of my life? And, you know, and this is just part of the um, the process and the, you know, the results of the experiences I've been through. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Mary Carlisle. I've been in the Air Force for 20 years, and my specialty is critical care nursing. Major Ivana Blackledge. I've been in the Air Force 17 years, uh, primarily as a critical care nurse. In OEF, OIF, I deployed to Iraq in 2003. Then in 2007, deployed as ICU nurse to Balad Air Force Base. I was the night shift shift leader in the intensive care unit at Balad. Before I deployed, I thought, I'm an experienced critical care nurse. There's nothing I can't handle. But that quickly changed, and the casualties came in every single night. Uh, IED blasts, burns. The helicopters would come in one right after the other, and it was so noisy with the generators and the people shouting and the heat and the, these horrific injuries over and over. Every day, horrendous things that we saw and had to take care of. The caregivers have to take care of these patients and how do you support them? A young soldier, airman, marine, sailor, who's lost a leg, who's lost an arm, who's lost two arms. How do you let a patient die? I started feeling very, very angry, and I think it was because we were in such a helpless situation. There were many women, children, service members that, that died, and I took care of them as they died. And it just went against what is ingrained in me, and that's saving lives. And you just get this overwhelming sense of helplessness and hopelessness. And I brought that home with me. My name is Major Jeff Hall. I've been in the Army for 17 years. Major Hall was my battery commander for Operation Iraqi Freedom 1 and 3. If he said that we were going to storm the gates of hell today, I would say, all right, sir, let's go. The first deployment, when we entered Baghdad, the people were really glad to see us. It seemed like the year just flew by. Captured a lot of people that needed to be captured. Um, it just seemed like we could do our job. It was the second tour that I started to really feel it grinding down on me. I couldn't find anything that we were doing that was advancing the ball down the field. We essentially was kind of just driving around until we got blown up. We had uh, an IED incident where two of the guys that was in my tank unit that was attached to me was killed and one of the lieutenants was uh, wounded severely and um, I don't know why but that shook me I mean it really shook me to the bone I had seen dead GIs before uh, I'd held a couple of guys as the chopper came in to pick them up and um, I just always was able to troop on but for some reason it was like the the straw that broke the camel's back for me and my anger started to really come out. I could tell when he walked in the door of the hangar, he wasn't the same man. He would say things and his eyes would get black. He would have a deep, dark look in his eyes and that was not Jeff at all. We just kept hoping that things would get better, but it wasn't. I am Staff Sergeant Meg Krause. I was on active duty for five years. I joined the reserves when I came out of active duty and now I'm the non-commissioned officer in charge of a battalion aid station for a combat engineering unit in Pennsylvania. Operation Rocky Freedom, I flew combat casualty missions. So we'd pick patients up and fly them from Baghdad back to Germany for medical care. I was stop lost in 2006. I would have gotten out of the service, but I was deployed to Iraq at the time, just outside of Tikrit. I was a medic. We got more a lot and we always say that when everybody else has to turn away in full security, we have to turn around and face the damage. My psychological health, I didn't think it was an issue when I came home. You know, I'm going to be okay, I'm not going to be one of those people who clams up and doesn't talk about it and can't handle it. And It wasn't until two and a half years later when I was in the high stress of graduating from college you know, writing papers, taking tests, looking for a job, looking for an apartment, um, everything I've worked for for goodness only knows how many years is coming to a close and I don't